Right. So apologies for a few technical hitches there. We are live. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining us this morning um, for this professional beauty webinar. Um, our topic today is coping with and adapting to the new normal in salons. Um, I'm Eve Oxbury. I'm the head of editorial at Professional Beauty. And today, as you can see, I've got with me Lisa Smith. Um, many of you will know her. She is a session nail artist and um, owner of Bodyline Salon in Kent. So hi, Lisa. Thanks for joining us. Hi, it's lovely to be here. So, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about adapting to the new normal. Um, if you've got any questions as we go along, if you're watching in Zoom, if you um, click the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type any questions there, or also in the chat function as we go along, um, we will have time to answer questions as we go. And um, if you're watching over on Facebook, then just pop any questions in the comments and we will get to them. So, Fab, yeah, Lisa, I think um, we were talking just before we started and a bit in advance about your involvement in um, the guidelines and everything that's been going on uh, for salons. So I was hoping we could start with that, really. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, the guidelines for close contact services and your involvement in, in advising on those? Yeah, OK. Um, initially, um, early, early down days of lockdown, I was talking to Marion Newman a lot um with the start of her new uh, her group Maggie's chat show and the conversation also involved Millie Kendall who I've met before but knows Marion very well um, Marion was involved with setting up the practical guidelines for the nail industry um, to help because obviously the British Beauty Council is beauty based and Marion is their expert on nails and then when they got contacted by Bayes um, which is the government branch for business and enterprise um, they said that they wanted to get a task force together for close contact services, so non-essential retail. Remember the confusion in the early days as to whether we were retail, non-essential non retail, hospitality, you know, no one knew quite where to put our category. And so they set up this task force for called close contact services, non-essential retail close contact services. And um, Marion put me forward and suggested to Millie that I go on there because they wanted some salons because they had all the industry bodies like Babtech and NHBF and um, the Barbers Association and all of those groups and they had and obviously Millie was on there as well and then they wanted some hair salons and beauty salons and some nail salons so I was put forward to put my perspective because obviously it's, open, it's one way of putting you have to get these guidelines but they also have to work they have to be effective and we have to be able to implement them so the two things that i was uh, we was able to give five minutes we had a it was very exciting actually it was in the early days of lockdown so i hadn't done too many big webinar type things um and we was on a microsoft teams meeting with everybody and we was all given a few minutes to say what our specific pointers were and my and I'd, I'd ask people what their pointers were and mine were um, because we'd been given the, the rough guidelines in advance so that we could have a look and then make pointers as to whether we felt they were appropriate or not. And um, because all the hard work had been done by Marion and Millie um, and this task force was put forward and there was my questions were um, what happens with home salons and mobiles. You know, there was no real specification at that time for what happens for people outside of a sound environment. And also the, the whole thing about screens, because I was getting inundated on a daily basis by customers, friends, clients, you know, friends of friends of friends of friends and professionals about screens. And mm. at the time, Doug Shoon had been quite um, vocal and said that it would be a false sense of security if you just put a screen between you because um, as nail professionals we create dust and the virus will travel on dust. I think most people know this now but in the early days it was not talked about and government were not really um, sort of taking that on board. So I, I just felt at the time and then beyond that, beyond the meeting, I wasn't involved again until when they put the final um, guidelines together then everybody on that meeting myself included was given access and a weekend to look at them and make comments and I spoke to Millie and Marion about you know anything that I felt I needed to say took their advice and um and Millie said just write as much as you can literally go into as much detail as you can give them as much as you can you know quotes and stuff and everything and 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 you know 
research everything you've got chuck it at them um because this is the last chance we've got and right. and and that was it and they came out and then obviously there's been a few difficulties since uh, a few uh, misinterpretations um but yeah it was it was a very privileged thing to do and i i i was excited and nervous and everything else that you would imagine to be but what now i've done that i feel as though almost i can step into that role now without that fear because everybody was fine yeah and you know the reasonings behind everything and yeah yeah so yeah so um with that i mean with the guidelines i think when they initially started to come out people and um, a lot of salon owners did feel that um salons have been treated unfairly compared to some other sectors in terms of the amount of ppe required and the, the number of rules in place i suppose yeah. compared with other client facing industries like um hospitality you know like bars and restaurants there's not that same level of uh, of ppe um do you think that it that it is fair how do you um how do you think those decisions were reached and do you think that they have been okay fair? the only one that really sticks in everybody's goat and I think still in mine is Beardgate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's, there has never been anybody that has been prepared to stand up and, and argue the reasons for that. So I can only assume that it was an oversight. And that was the whole point that Caroline, Caroline Hirons and Millie and everybody else was getting on about was the fact that it, it was very definitely a sexist element to that decision uh, through lack of knowledge, ignorance, um just being very very unaware of the industry and the way that they were putting that forward but i would say that the main thing that differentiates uh, differentiates our industry to say hospitality is our close proximity and it is the close proximity especially with nails because you are face to face within us yeah. within a within a meter distance so i think with regards to ppe there has been adjustments and changes and they have listened at last and now a lot of people have had problems with visors so now they've said that you can um, have an alternative of safety goggles slash glasses and even that was misinterpreted for a little while and i must admit i got it wrong i thought they was insisting on goggles and mm -hmm. i thought i'd rather suffer with a visor than look like a minion so <laughs> yeah, just imagine these like you know suckered onto yeah. your face um but it, when, when somebody pointed out to me, we reread it and it did actually say safety glasses, which have to be bought from places like, um, I'm going to say screw fix out of the top of the top of my head, but it's got to be bought from a proper, a, a proper environment that has got a, a steady safety record. Do not buy these things on eBay and, and Amazon yeah. because yeah. It, you're just going to go down a, a rabbit hole, really. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think, I think, um, we, we have to wear an exorbitant amount of PPE and I do think it's been unfair. My biggest unfairness apart from Beardgate is the fact that hospitality have had their VAT lowered for 5%. We are still paying 20% because I know most people don't aren't VAT registered, but there's a big percentage in the industry at the top end that are VAT registered. Mm. And that, that is crucifying now. I'm not even thinking about my VAT bill for next year. That's, you know, we've just got to spend as much as possible to offset it. So they've had it lowered to 5%. We haven't. They yeah. went back before we did. They don't have the, the, the cost that we are having with PPE. And then to add insult to injury, they were given the eat out to help out, um, yeah. which yeah. which has been sort of, I'd say if you speak to business people, if you speak to people who know what they're talking about, with hospital in hospitality they'll say that it wasn't necessarily the success that people thought it, it, it you know it, it increased i've got to say from a personal point of uh, uh, view stand is the fact that i went out three times on that month and i haven't i've only been out once since so i do think it it's not necessarily something we need to cover mm. the, the vat coming down to five percent would be amazing but i can't see it happening um but i think there has been a slight injustice the beard gate was the biggest but we got we got that sorted you know it took them two weeks but we did get the fact that they and also at the same time that we were allowed to work on the face um barbers and hairdressers had to also wear masks as well as visors yeah. so that that was an, a massive equaling out of of the situation yeah yeah because i think that was difficult for people too wasn't it seeing hairdressers go back to work and, and beauty not being able to and they you know it was all very quite very different place, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, all they had to do was put some hand gel on the on the side, and 
and, and put a, a sign up saying you're COVID safe. That's it. There, there yeah. was, you know, th- th- it wasn't it. They hadn't, if they'd done their risk assessment properly, there would have been a lot more they had to do, but that's what was happening. And it was, it was hard to, for people to see that. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly, as you say, when there were rules in place that weren't always being stuck to, it's, it's, it's yeah. difficult. Yeah. And so with, I mean, obviously, as we just touched on, the, the rules around PPE have just changed slightly and with the option of, of goggles instead of the visor and still have to wear a mask all day. Um, how have you as a salon owner and your team been coping with the PPE? Because um, I know that a lot of therapists mm. are struggling a bit. I think, um, you know, it's particularly at the moment, it's very hot in a lot of areas. It's difficult. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice around that for therapists and techs who are struggling? Yeah, when... In the early days when we were still in lockdown, um, I must admit, I and I was in a position to do this. And I'm not I'm I've got to understand that not everybody, not everybody got financial help. You know, not everybody got the grant. Not everybody um, was able to source multiple types of PPE. But that's what I did. And we in the salon have three masks each. We've all graviated to wear one that we all particularly like, and we wouldn't know that until we got a, a chance to actually wear them. So we always knew that there would be a chance that some would work better than others. Um, and I do think you do have to find the one that suits you and find the one that's because we've got a number of staff that have got really small heads and really small faces, you know, like really diddy. Yeah. So, and, and obviously something that would fit me I've got with an average size head is, is literally swamping them. So um, it, I, we did a lot of research and as you know, I you know speak to Marion a lot and, and we together had, had worked out what mask was needed for what treatment. And obviously I was instrumental in helping with the beauty side because Marion said, you know, that I, she's concentrating on the nails. So um, I did a video um, early days of me doing some eyebrows on my receptionist. This is before we went back and I was fully PP'd up with a mask and a visor and she had a mask on and a handheld old hairdressing hairspray shield that literally just covered her from there down. So she had double protection and I had double protection. And I sent that to Millie and that obviously, and I, she said that she would send that on to government. So um, I think the, prob- the two problems people are having, one is MACNI you know, Mm -hmm. the whole reaction of your skin um, to being covered when it's not used to, especially in the hotter days. In the South, we've just had another three or four days of real hot weather again. Um, And the second problem is this, well, there's three, the struggling to not breathe, because we all know in our intelligence that you can breathe and it's not doesn't affect you, but it is making people have dry throats, dry mouths. Um, And then the third problem, which is more serious, I think, is their eyes. Um, and that's why the safety glasses now have been um, allowed because the visors sit two to three inches away from your eyes and your eyes focus on the visor. They don't focus. And so if you're close to someone and trying to concentrate on a hair on someone's eyebrow, your eyes are struggling to focus beyond the visor. Mm. Whereas safety glasses are where glasses should be and you will see through the glass, not plastic. Okay. Yeah. So I would strongly suggest anybody that is struggling with a visor because of eyesight, because they're wearing glasses, then the safety. And if you if it's just you and you only have you to spend money on, you can get them prescription made as well. So um, I don't know any details of that, but I've been told that you can get them prescription, even if it's just mainly for short sightedness. I don't know that you can actually get your like you know your individual prescription in there but you can get them to be mm-hmm. like you've got reading glasses on okay, that's great so yeah. so the glasses i would definitely say do that um skin people have got to definitely and i'm sure they've discovered this by now is definitely not wear makeup underneath their mask it's all about the eyes i mean we've been saying this for a while now but it's all about the eyes and literally no no makeup um, because you're going to be covering your face, no SPF, nothing that's on your face that is going to create a, a, a barrier, like a like a sweaty barrier. Yeah. So, and we we should know about doffing and donning dark masks by now, and the fact that you shouldn't touch your mask until you've washed your hands. So, where possible, on a break, wash your hand, take your mask off. We've got these little plastic cups with a lid with their names on them. In the salon, we've all got our own. And literally, we wash our hands, take our mask off by the hoops and pop it face down in the in a plastic cup, put the lid on, then wash your hands again, 
and then maybe wipe your face over if you feel the need to, you know, with a quick freshener and just make sure that you've got a little bit of air going to your mm -hmm. skin. And then when you put it back on, wash your hands, put it back on, wash your hands again. So it's all, it's this procedure. And for a lot of people, it is, um, it's finding the schedule and the timing to be able to fit another thing in. Yeah. Um, so the, the, and the last thing, the breathing thing, and we've been talking to the clients about this because they've been, they only have to wear one when they go in somewhere. So what you see people doing is you go into a shop, they come out and they take their mask off and then they put it in their bag and then they put it back on again when they go in. And what we've discovered as therapists is the longer you wear it, the better it gets. You know, personally, and most of our team have agreed that if you literally, I literally get out of my car in the morning put my mask on and wear it into work because I'm hoping that by the, you know it takes 10 minutes okay at yeah. least for your face to stop sweating mm. you know for it to accept that this is the state of play and your 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 skin will stop overreacting to producing oil and moisture for whatever reason it's decided to do so wow. and so keep your mask on you know we've all I've just covered the hand washing thing so you don't want to be doing that every 20 minutes anyway you haven't got time to do that but the, get one that fits well, get one that feels comfortable. Um, and we use washable ones so that, that obviously we can use them um, repeatedly. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I think personally, the, the, we also offer our client the, the visor. We, you know, when we're doing face-to-face -face close proximity, so when we're doing nails, um, we have um, a proper big, um, the, the, the mask man mask. Um, that has a proper big on um, filter inside that you have to replace, not wash um, every couple of months. And it's got the valves and everything. It fits around the back of your head. Uh, it's called the global travel mask. And that we've got that when we're doing dust because that dust, when you're creating that is our biggest problem with PPE. Mm. And once you've got that on, you don't really want a visor on as well because it's quite a hefty piece of kit. Yeah. So what we do is we get our clients to wear their mask and the visor because the, the, it says you have to have a barrier between you. And so it's either okay. a screen on your desk or one of you wears a visor. There's, uh, there's, someone said that they asked their insurance company and their insurance company insisted they wear the visor. Hmm. This might be controversial, but we, we, bought, we all know this, that insurance companies are not in, in, the, in our high esteems right now, that they, they don't genuinely know what we know. I can back my decision up by my risk assessment. And as long as you've documented why you're doing that in your risk assessment, nobody will disqualify you for it. So I haven't asked my insurance company, but I'm in quite good good, um, you know, terms with them. And I know that they trust me. And I know that maybe I should, maybe I should put it to them. And so that at least they're helping other people if they phone up with the same query. Mm. But genuinely that helps. Okay, now that's really interesting. And I think, um, as you say, it's about finding what works for you and your team, isn't it? And I think, I guess, everyone's had a lot of trial and error over the last um, six weeks or so since Salon yeah. started yeah. coming back. So, but some really good tips, I think. Um, yeah, particularly interesting about just getting used to it, because I suppose, again, that makes sense. It's like anything initially, it's just, you just want to take it off, don't you? And it's just how yeah. you can kind of get into that again. your skin will react it's not used to you covering it especially if you're hot you yeah know, if you're hot you're but one of your ways of cooling down is to sweat you know you cover your face it instantly thinks you're hot so it sweats yeah you know what well, it doesn't think you're hot you are hot because it makes you hot so you sweat but that will settle down if you keep taking it on and off it doesn't give it the opportunity to adjust and and to settle down but it does settle down the only good thing that I will put, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but I, I did two and a half hours of waxing yesterday on the trot in a hot, on a hot day. And every time you do that, when you wear your mask uh, in, in a hot environment, when you take your mask off, you can give your nose a really good blow. Honestly, it's the most simplest thing. I never thought I'd enjoy, you know, a, a nose blow, but it actually, it's like it's given your nose a sauna. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's like it's, it's <laughs> like it's you know when you come out and that's why people go into saunas to clear their tubes and yeah. you know honestly wearing a mask doing a hot job really does clear you and and allows you to it, it's great if anyone is suffering then they need to go and do a do a two hour you know gardening episode with their mask on because it really does make you it does allow you to blow your nose nicely.
Well, there you go. There's a silver lining in, uh, in all of this. Um, we've had tons of comments already on Facebook, which is which is great. Um, lots of people say, well, someone's saying, if surgeons and doctors and nurses can wear masks all day, so can we. It's the new normal, um, like putting a seatbelt on in a car. We just need to be the professionals we are and get on with it. Yeah. But yeah, it's a good, I mean, it is. it looks like it's pretty here to stay, particularly for the foreseeable future. So I yeah. guess this is it. We've got to find ways to deal with it. Well, I will say, I will say in, res in, in response to that comment, um, I saw somebody um, mention this recently online and somebody um, commented saying that their client is a doctor and she said that doctors and nurses, unless they are on a COVID ward where they have to do full PPE, more than us, because obviously they've got the whole, the whole shebang, um, but they only do that for a maximum time yeah and, and then they have to go and have a break and also um if nurses and doctors are they're only wearing masks and ppe in a face-to-face -face, um, situation so it's we are actually up there with the people that are wearing it for the longest time yeah so it's not to be sniffed at but we do have to get on with it and do with it you're, you're correct it is it's something that is our new normal but yeah. we, we are up there. We've got to put a pat on the back because we are up there with people that are wearing it for the longest time. Yeah, yeah. And actually, we have had a, another comment on Facebook saying, I've got a client who's an oncologist who couldn't believe the PPE we're being asked to wear. So, yeah, I think this is it. And this is, as we were saying, why some people do feel a bit that we have, well, that the beauty industry has been unfairly treated in this. But I think, you know, as we say, for now, this is... A, it this is the close proximity face-to-face, -to -face, though. Mm -hmm. It is that close... But again, yeah, to, if, if, to look on the other side, I have a client who's, um, um, a, um, oh, it's the name fails me at the moment, radiologist, you know, that do scans. And she only wears a surgical mask um, when she's dealing with scanning people. And that's in a hospital environment. So, you know, we, we, have, we have definitely, um, but I'm, so, I'm so pleased that the hairdressing, because I'm a hairdresser as well. I'm, I'm so pleased that the hairdressing industry have to now wear a mask and a visor because yeah. it's only fair because I know how close I get when I trim someone's fringe you know and yeah. you are closer when you're trimming a fringe than you are when you're doing nails mm, definitely yeah yeah and yeah. um, so I guess moving on from the PPE side what are some of the other issues that um as a salon owner you're finding the, the hardest or, or the salon owners you're speaking to because also you've been um quite involved in mentoring and, and coaching salon owners haven't you during lockdown so yeah, what yeah. are some of the other issues that you've been kind of helping people through or, or experiencing yourself as a salon? Okay, owner? yeah, I think um, I think it, it really does. Um, it, we are feeling the same problems. It just depends on the, the size of your business and the size of your team as to how much one problem comes to another. And I will say this, that I have a little bit more, uh, um, what's the word? support for the government struggle right now in as much as they have the the economy to boost and they have the health of the, the, for the nation to protect mm -hmm. and it's a really big balancing act so when we went back our first priority was safety understandably you know pp'd up to the eyeballs multiple choices of ppe new protocol new procedures new risk assessments we became almost experts and in a good way, in as much as I don't think any of us really treated risk assessments in quite as much detail ever before. It was only ever done as a, as a standard procedure. So, um, but now, very quickly, after, this, this, after we settled down with that safety element, which the government has done as well, obviously, they've, they've, got us, it, they've got us opened up. Now, the biggest concern is finances. And, but there's only so much you can do with the financial side without affecting that balance of safety. So my thing at the moment is the fact that I have a split team. So mm -hmm. there's 10 of us in total um, and we um, have split our team into two. So we have one like manager, one receptionist, therapist and, and a junior. And we are working only um, 24 hours a week e like each team. We normally work 40 hours a week so at what point, and the point with the reason we split the team was because if we did have a track and trace situation and we had to isolate, because in the early days, no one knew what that would look like. No one knew what that would, um, how that would pan out. We had to assume the worst 
the fact that if somebody phoned us and said, I was in your salon three days ago and I've had a test, a positive test, we assume we would have to close the salon for 14 days and everybody self-isolate, deep clean. Well, as we've come through, we're realizing that's not necessarily quite as drastic as that, but we did decide that if we had a test and trace positive um, result, we only one team would isolate and then the other the other team would still carry on. So that was protecting the business. Now, um, I am thinking of merging the teams. We have to merge the teams before furlough runs out because there's no way my teams, we can probably get them to 30 hours, but we can't get them to 40 hours if we're working only part time because we can't all be in there at the same time. So we are thinking of the two shifts going back one doing eight till three and one doing 12 till eight. So there's only a three hour window in the middle where we're all together, which we've got to be, and our, our thing is concentrating on social distancing. We have, we've got to really strengthen up our social distancing and not get comfortable, which I think we've all got a little bit comfortable with. We're, we're wearing masks so we feel that we're okay, but actually we just need to stay at distance. So the financial side, and what I, what I found is there, I did a survey amongst our clients and I, I talked to other salon owners and I feel that you can split clients into three groups at the moment. So these are clients, say the clients you had between January and March. If you look to all of those, there's no reason, like I think, why are the reasons are they not all just in? Why does September not look like March did? Okay, and you split them in three types. The first type is because they're scared and I, they, they are, as I've now discovered, are in the minority, but there is an element of people that are either for health reasons, self, you know, shielding or whatever, or just very anxious and not coming back in. The second one is because they've had a change to their finances or they're concerned about finances stopping in the future. So they're hoarding or just saving. And the third one, and this is the biggest group, is there's not got a reason to return. They've had three months, four months of not having their nails done and then thought, well, maybe I can cope with my natural nails right now. Um, they've had, um, I mean, the, the two biggest things that, that me personally and lots of clients came back for was waxing and hair. Yeah. You know, waxing and hair is like, uh, people would be knocking down your door. Me, I was the same. I, could, I couldn't wait to get my waxing done and my hair done. But everything else in the middle has been very slow to build back up again. Yeah. And I think what I advise people to do was to hit all three of those. The financials, you can't really do anything about and actually have to accept that those set of clients at the moment are not your clients. They will be when they've come back to some normality or they feel comfortable to spend money again, but you can't just doc, you can't just discount everything hoping to get those back in. I would leave that group to one side. The scared ones, some of them will not come back in, but you must have already, if you haven't already, you must start interspersing your messaging in your social media and showing people how safe they are do mini videos of how the fact that you might be now using single use files or um a, a picture of all of you and your ppe waving you know whatever it is whatever it takes just constantly remind people that you're safe but the biggest one and this is the biggest message that you have to put out is you have to give people a reason to return they're not going on holiday they're not going to weddings they're not going out on the weekends they're not doing anything that would normally say to you oh actually I know I only normally come for my manicure but I need my waxing done my lashes done my, because I'm going to x y or z so yeah. we have changed their messaging from to a, a message of self-care okay. so yeah. we've done an awful lot and the, I might as well say uh, like now that the, the the eat out to help out voucher um, some people started doing a chill out to help out thing where <laughs> they did the same thing we're offering half price treatments or whatever and obviously not getting the help back from the government yeah which yeah. which is 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 okay occasionally but it's dangerous ground because you start building a, an, a, an atmosphere of shoppers for offers you know yeah. people that are just waiting for that offer to come out before they spend money now what we did and we found out we did it the first time by accident because you're the 30 i know exactly i can tell you the time it's it upset me that much the 31st of July at 12.30, Boris Johnson came on, on telly and said that we wasn't allowed to do facial treatments the next day. Yeah, no, the next day. day. <laughs> and and I, I was working from home that day and I was thinking, I might actually, I'm not got any, any I've got nothing going on. I, I have no trainings. I can actually just chill today. No. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the 
poop hit the fan and we had to rip out three thousand pounds worth of treatments for the next 10 days out of our book mm -hmm. i had a lot of space to fill so i decided to put an offer out and it was a buy one get one free and it went off like a rocket so basically if you've got an empty space that is not going to fill tomorrow then you know i'm not thinking you should be doing this as, as a long-term thing then offering buy one get one free the cheapest one free means that people are coming in and spending money yeah. and this hits that no reason to come in you know they're, they're not motivated there's no reason they've got the money they're not particularly scared they're just not bothered yeah you know they're just not actually there's no mo motivation so giving and that really worked so because i witnessed that myself i thought okay this is this we can tweak this slightly so what we have done since is the chill out to help out we've done that as a post and every now and then when one of the teams has got a very quiet day we offer it out and people are spending 50 pounds they're coming in for a facial and getting a free massage they're going to do that if they're going to get two hours worth of treatment for a price of one hour it's sometimes which proves my point they've got the money yeah and they're not scared to come in yeah. they just didn't have a reason to come in okay but no that's interesting and a good point um because i think as, as we were talking about before we went live um with the eat out to help out scheme it, it got lots of people into bars and restaurants during august but it hasn't necessarily continued into september yeah. so it's it's discounting when you need to and kind of using those tools but yeah i don't it's not necessarily the way is it for the industry to try and, uh, and get loyalty back and get these repeat customers back i mean if you can get them in the door yeah and it does work if it if it's a trigger that you can pull and turn it on when you need it then then your job is then to make sure your customer journey is immaculate mm. and that i mean we i've just recently that i haven't given it to my staff yet but we're just about to do some training with it on it um on friday i've just done another a form where i want them to fill it out this is now making them accountable that we talked briefly about how staff had a long time off and might not feel comfortable they they've mm. been a bit slow to return to their normal mojo um luckily that we've had none of them none of mine have been anxious they've just maybe needed to be led a little bit more but almost like they didn't they haven't got their usual um get up and go about them so um i'm actually gonna i've written this form out and i want them to put the, the client's name what they've had done were they a first client were they uh, did they come in on an offer and um, did you upsell did they rebook some comments okay. so i literally they, they're gonna have to make themselves accountable now yeah, yeah. and not in a bad way it's just and it might be the first two two days or three days they do this they look and there's not really any positives like no rebooks no upsells but but by looking at it it then that gives them the opportunity to look next time I am actually going to push for the rebook. I'm actually going to, to talk more about the products that back up their treatment. So it's just building their self-esteem back up again, I think. Okay, that's interesting. Cause I think also, as you say, making them accountable, but also more involved in the business and, yeah. and its success is yeah. it's always a good thing. Cause um, another thing I wanted to touch on, I mean, obviously, as you say, people have in some senses struggled a little bit as they've come back from furlough and they've been used to being off. And now there's a lot of difficulties in, in some ways with the new normal in salons. Um, but we've also got the issue now, I think, of um, a lot of salons out there being faced with tough decisions about um, making redundancies or, or cuts to, to their team's hours. So morale is a little bit low in some in some businesses. Um, so are there any other kind of tips that you can share for, for helping to keep people motivated because i think that that's now that the initial excitement of being bit back reopened has died down and actually business hasn't been as as, as good for some people as they hoped and um, it's quite tough out there so how do you keep your team or how do the salon owners keep their teams engaged and excited and, and positive yeah it's i i know that the the biggest thing that has affected my team for hours is the split team you know we 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 don't fill the same team again yet you know we're, we're um and i do think that some of us you know some of us um some of us are better leaders than others some of them some of us need leading and some of us don't um some need discipline some don't it's a bit like being a parent isn't it you know you've got to you've got to look at each individual um team member and find out what they need and i recently have um reached out to a few of my team members that are not on my team 
and said, right, okay, um, let's let's give you a different role. You know, one of my team members was going to be educating in my academy with me. Um, I'd done some, you know, I've done all the training and everything. And, and because that side of things is, is is a bit unsure at the moment and is a bit slow to return, um, we we I've now need to find her another role. So I think you just said about being involved with them in the business, and I think that is crucial. I think I looking at myself, if we all look at ourselves and see what we've done right and what we've done could have done better. I personally think as we approached March, I'd got my business to such a good place, such a comfortable place that maybe I'd taken my foot off the pedal and, and it was fine. It wasn't having any harm, but now we've gone back. We're almost starting from zero again. I almost feel like I have started a new business. Mm. You know, I, I feel as a salon owner that I have started, I've had to look at ways. I, my, I'm constantly having to look at ways to make sure that everybody's happy that everybody knows what respected of them know know the new protocol um and what i would say is um obviously we have to have a zoom staff meeting now we used to have a friday morning staff meeting every week in in person but now we have to have it on zoom so half of us are at home and half of us are in the salon but we've blocked that time out and we will have a zoom meeting um communication meetings where possible um individually looking at somebody and saying do you need i hope you can you hear that <laughs> a little bit <laughs> you got some... <laughs> we had this conversation didn't we someone has now decided next door to start banging <laughs> it's, it's not too it's true. fine it's fine i can talk louder it's okay um so i think you've got to literally it's almost like you've got to start appraisals right now it's and moving forward to think about maybe um redundancies i mean it's i'm my sole focus for the next six weeks is getting my team back together so that we can increase their hours i know for a fact that some of my team will not be on the same hours that they were in march yeah but i'm i'm fingers crossed i'm i'm adamant that we're not going to have any redundancies but we won't know until probably four weeks time yeah. but i think with regards to on speaking as if I was speaking just to salon owners right now, I would be saying that, that this is the time for them to make some tough decisions. Mm. You know, this is the time for them to actually look at their business from scratch and say, were we overstaffed? Um, you know, and, and this is really when the chips are down, this is really when people stand up or sit down. Yeah. And the people any, that so I could say, do you have any advice on how to make those decisions? Because I think a lot of people are thinking, well, I'm going to have to either cut hours or potentially make redundancies or, or, or change contracts. I mean, I know some people are talking about zero hour contracts um, yeah. or work with self-employed practitioners sometimes. Are there any, how, what are the best ways to, to make those decisions for your business? Okay, first of all, with contracts, hopefully, and I think you've still got time to make changes if you haven't, you must, in your contract of employment with your staff, have a short hours, a reduced hours clause. Um, I know that we've got that in there. Um, I've never had to use it before, but when we were um, coming back, that was something I was looking quite closely at. But then I decided to split the team and we're all working 24 hours and we're furloughed for 14, uh, uh, 16. So obviously, as that moves into the furlough being taken away, we will be looking at reducing hours. So if you haven't got that in your contract, you need to take a legal advice and get that into your contract now. You then need to um, give them that contract new contract to your staff and make them understand that you will maybe to, to it, you are going to be faced with two decisions you either let some per, somebody go or you reduce the hours of maybe two or three and you know it, you've got to look at your percentage of bookings and make sure that you're not making a hasty decision don't make any hasty decisions which i'm pretty sure nobody would want to do but this is your one time to make a valid decision to let somebody go mm. um i think reducing hours across three or four staff members is better than making somebody redundant and then if that if that person is not making it by christmas then maybe that's the time to then make them redundant this will obviously be very very appropriate to everybody's individual finances with regards to working with self-employed i've done that on two occasions in the last 30 years and it's something that i personally um, don't won't do and don't want to do. I have 
to have control over my business. And the only time I think it's viable for you to have self-employed contractors is, especially if you're wanting to merge, because if you're wanting to merge, if you're thinking, if I make that person self-employed, at least I no longer have the costs of their PAYE and their pension and their holidays, and they may be more motivated to work. That's usually the route that people think about taking, going from employed to self-employed. It really comes with its trickiness, real trickiness. You know, that person has had an employed um, piece of um, uh, attitude to go into self-employed is very difficult. And also as an employer, you are used to telling people what hours they work, when they should be there, when they shouldn't be there, what they do, what they don't do. As soon as they're self-employed, you have to let go of all of that. And it is super tough. Mm. And so having a merged team of employed and self-employed needs a lot of fine detail working. And it's only for, for people that are totally prepared to let go of that, of that control. If you have a group of self-employed people, if everyone goes self-employed, if you are buying your commercial premises and you've got a mortgage, then at least the people that are paying you their rent will pay that mortgage and you have an asset at the end of the mortgage term. If you just make everybody self-employed paying you a percentage or a small rent, and that basically means you work rent free, and that's the only benefit, you have to question whether it's actually worth you having a salon. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's too big a conversation for, for this time, but that's really the synopsis of it. And I think if you've got employees right now, look at reducing hours before you make redundancies. Um, look at, there's an equation you can um, work out. If it's called staff to turnover ratio, and all businesses have this equation. So if your turnover is £100,000 and your salary, your total salary cost, now total salary cost includes your contributions, PAY, everything, not what you pay your staff, everything. If your salary is £50,000, so half of your turnover, you are likely to be um, understaffed um, or not charging enough. You know, you're either undercharging or overstaffed because you should have a bigger percentage outside of what you pay in your salaries. If you are 30%, if, you're only, if your salary is only 30%, then the chances are you may be underpaying your staff. Okay. There, is, there is like a happy medium and because we are a service-led industry, because our biggest overhead walks on two legs, as in our staff, our wage bill is always going to be the biggest cost, there is, you know, between 40 and 50%, about 40% is perfect, you go above 50% and you're definitely under, overstaffed. Mm. So do that percentage, work out your turnover, work out your total salary costs, see what percentage you're at, if you're over 50%, You've, you're overstaffed okay. you need to let some people go yeah. or you need to put your prices up yeah yeah which I know is something that I've had a lot of debate on that recently <laughs> some people have gone down that route others just yeah, yeah. Time, but we have got our prices up and no one has said a word okay excellent. so that's that's good I'd like to do it again but I don't know whether we will <laughs> And we've had tons of comments and questions on Facebook as we've gone along and I've kind of worked a couple in and I know we're, uh, we're coming up to time, but I just wanted to, to get a couple in there. And we've had one comment about um, the new client journey is so important. Um, this is Jamie and she's saying we have a one way system and a locked door so no one can wander in and clients love how safe it all is. And we've also had lots of new clients saying that they've left their old salon because they knew it wasn't hygienic enough at this time. And this actually, this kind of feeds into what we were touching on again before we went live that, you know, Again, one, one positive through all of this might be that we, we see standards in the industry being raised and some of the, the salons that don't stick to the rules are, are not going to survive in, in this climate. Are they? Yeah, yeah. I do think, I do think uh, we're, we're all very aware that there is a very, very varying standards in our industry, as, as every industry. You know, there are, there are builders out there that, that, that you wouldn't want yeah. in your house. So I think there's always going to be a variance in, in standard. And at the end of the day, looking at your ideal client avatar that might have shifted slightly since lockdown and you should be taking advantage of the fact that people maybe are more aware of what they're looking for we've always said and my personal opinion has always been educate the public more than you educate the staff because yeah. if the public vote with their knowledge of what they should be expecting 
yeah, I, I um, the 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 video that um, there's a group of people on Madge's chat show that got together that created the Safe Salon Alliance, and we um, and they commissioned. We rate, did some self fund, you know, crowdfunding, got some money, and got a video made of the, yeah. of the client journey in a cartoon version, and that really should probably make the rounds again. You know, I think that's you know just put that on your social media because. Or, like I said, make your own. If you've got time on your hands, now's the time to prove that customer journey is what it is. Mm. And I think our, I've really put a lot of effort into our social media in the last month. And we are breaking down every treatment that we do and saying why it's different and why it's better. And making sure that all the lurkers out there that haven't quite made the switch to your salon know that when they are ready, you are the ones that they're going to go to. This is where, I think we're in this for the long haul. I think we've got to build the blocks now of shouting about how good and safe we are um, and how much we care. And hopefully over the next six to 12 months, that will start to show fruit. But it's really great that they they know that they've had clients move over because of that. Yeah. And that's something we always fail. I think sometimes we forget to ask questions. Yeah. You know, why, are that, why have you come in today? You're a new client. You know, can I ask why you've chose us today? That is another question that is pertinent we can't do anything. We can't make decisions if we don't know the circumstances of which we find ourselves in. So, and we'll, um, you mentioned the Salon Safe Alliance. We covered that on Professional Beauty, and I'll drop the link into the Facebook comments in a bit. So, okay. if anyone does so, want to yeah. find that again and download it, I'll put the link yeah. in there. Um, and I also will, we were mentioning um, a bit before as well, you have um, a bit of a guide to reopening, don't you? So, I'll put the link. For that yes. in as well, if people or the link to yeah. it, there, there is it's it's not set up on a landing page or anything at the moment. If okay. they just want to email me, then I will send that to them. Um, but I what happened um, because I was working closely with Marion and Millie, and and it's my way anyway of getting down and, and and really getting down to detail. I'd already done my risk assessment, my 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 literally my typed up return to work. So this is when people were at their peak worry. Um, and I said, I just said in a couple of groups, if you want to email me, I'll send you my return to work document is seven pages long. And this was obviously it's, it's outdated now. So what I've done is I've made it look a bit nicer because I didn't realize over 700 people emailed me for that for that document. So it was a little bit time consuming, but th that's told me that there was a, a need out there that people need a little bit of, of guidance. So the one that I've got now that I can email looks a bit nicer and it's actually more like a checklist of 10 things that they can do, some of which we've covered today, but it gives them the opportunity to start checklisting against their own circumstances. Excellent. So yeah, we'll put a note for anyone who wants to contact you about that. Okay. And just one other thing I wanted to touch on before we go, um, you were involved quite recently in the demo of the track and trace um, system that's launched. Yes. Can you just explain a little yeah. bit? About yeah, I think it's going to be really pertinent, actually. We're still trying to work out how it impacts us. But um, because I belong to the British Beauty Council, um, anybody who does was invited on. So it wasn't just me or any or Marion or any, there were, you know, many members of the British Beauty Council watched the demo from Bayes on the, the Track and Trace app. And the way that, that they are trying to encourage us as salon owners to get our staff and our customers to use it. And one of the things that I feel that it's going to help with is that it will, um, it, 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 you have, you download a QR code and, and you, you literally, um, it's track and trace has now become a legislative thing and you can use your salon software to say yes I know exactly who was in and when they left and all the rest of it you obviously can pre-qualify your clients to make sure by email to say they have they're not they haven't got any symptoms they don't live with anyone with symptoms but we we've been doing the form on the front desk so when people have got the app on their phone they download I think it launched on the 24th I know there's a massive hoo-ha about testing at the moment and I think I'm hoping it's not going to push the, 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 the launch date, late date back. But at the moment, it launched on the 24th of September. You can download it, log in, and everybody, if everybody's got it, when, they, when you check in, say, let's give you a scenario, it makes it easier to explain. If, say, you, uh, if you came to my salon at three o'clock yesterday and you had the app and you, um, you scanned in on my salon at that time, in a week's time, you have a positive COVID test. And that app anonymously, so we don't know who they are, anonymously sends out a, a message to 
everywhere that you've checked into within us within a certain amount of days so then that person that that business because they've obviously got our contact details that business will then be notified to say that somebody has had was in on this day um, and they've had positive test now mm -hmm. it means now personally we've spoken to our clients and they are all aware that we would like them to tell us immediately if they've had a positive test so that we can act accordingly but even though we don't do walk-ins we do have some clients that maybe come for one time and maybe don't come again for a while they wouldn't necessarily remember or think to tell us so this is like a safeguard this is like a way of it will automatically tell us that somebody has um tested positive and they was in your business on this day now that person so what we will do so what we want to do is actually identify what that per who that person is so yeah. we would actually phone all those clients and say you know um can i just confirm whether you've had a positive test in the last seven days we've been informed that somebody on that day has um and if it's not them then obviously at that stage we would then say and when we find out and locate who that person is we will tell you if he was in the so in the salon at the same time you will now need to self-isolate so it's just giving you another layer of how you you track and and sort out and decide what you're going to do yeah. and the fact that we're trying to merge our team will all come after this app is launched and hopefully dependent on how many people have got it and how many people download and use it it's just adding another layer of how you deal with it and how you narrow it down because again that then that will also be another feather in your cap to say to your clients we're keeping you even safer mm. you know it's it's just adding layers and layers and layers that's all it's doing yeah. so like i said it's it, i understand it more in my own brain than i can explain it but those are the gradually we're getting a little bit more to grips with it um but they have um down they have um let go of um all the downloads of how it how it how, how it works it is really clever and it is anonymous so as fact that it's anonymous is obviously good for people who value their privacy yeah. but the only difficulty there with us is we have to then do our own research and, and detective work and find out which client that day right. it, it, it was so we can start ruling people out at least so but a really useful tool for people because obviously the, the changes to the um the guidance have also included fines for people that aren't complying with track and trace so anyway, yeah and you can you do and and because not everybody's going to download it and not everybody's got the ability to they don't all have a smartphone so we will still keep our paper option going for those people and the other thing i will say is i've made the decision not to put the code on my door i want to put the code on my reception desk because if they don't do it in front of us we will get them to do the paper version sure so exactly. that's just another safeguard really just double checking yeah Excellent. Well, we cut, we've run out of time, I think. Oh. Really afraid, but it's been so useful, and we've had a lot of uh, a lot of really nice comments over on Facebook. I, I will check the comments, and if anyone's got any other questions on a replay, just I will just keep checking in every now and then, and if there's anything that then I can oh, just I answer on the day. That's fabulous, because yeah, there's a couple of comments. People saying, well, "I missed this. What was that?" So if you, yeah, we yeah. will be able to watch the video back on the Facebook page, um, and yeah. Any other comments, yeah. drop them there. But um, for now, thank you so much, Lisa Smith. It's been really fantastic to have you. It did go really quick, didn't it? It did, yeah. <laughs> there's tons to talk about. I think there's so many things yeah. that are on everyone's mind with this new normal, but it's been really good to have your advice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and thanks everyone for watching and um, we've got more webinars coming up this week so keep an eye on professionalbeauty.co.uk forward slash webinars there's another one this week and then we're doing two to three a week now ongoing so yeah we'll see you again soon thanks bye bye